Good afternoon. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship today. And I have two announcements for what's coming up here at the church. Uh, not this Sunday, but the following on the 24th. We'll be having, we'll be having the next of our meals together as a church. Uh, we, call it our, we call it our heritage meal. We get together and we cook or bake what our grandma would have brought to such a meal, carrion. And uh, it's a delicious and a very, very healthy meal. <laughs> Lots of butter involved in this type of cooking. So uh, that's a good time. That's on the 24th. And then the next Sunday, uh, we'll have the celebration of all of the saints. It's All Saints, Halloween, All Saints uh, weekend. And uh, we'll be taking a moment to name all of those saints who we dearly wish could be with us. The ones who have uh, taught us the faith and made it possible for us to be here today. And so that will be part of our worship. If you have someone you'd like to have named during that time, we name each and every one of those, those saints during uh, our communion. Um, please let me know. Uh, email me, message the church, whatever uh, works for you. So uh, with that, I think we're ready to continue on with Timothy. Uh, Paul's letter to uh, Timothy is he's working for the good of the church at Ephesus. He writes, Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as to a father, younger men as brothers, to older women as mothers, to younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. Honor widows who are really widows. If a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn their religion, for their religious duty to their own family, and make some repayment to their parents, for this is pleasing in God's sight. The real widows, left alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give these commands as well, so that they may be above reproach. And whoever does not provide for relatives, especially for family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be put on the list if she is not less than 60 years old and has been married only once. She must be well attested for her good works as one who has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted and devoted herself to good in every way, but refused to put younger widows on the list, for when their sensual desires alienate them from Christ, they want to marry, and so they incur condemnation for having violated their first pledge. Besides that, they learn to be idle, gadding about from house to house, and they are not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not say. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and manage their households, so as to give the adversary no occasion to revile us. For some have already turned away to follow Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are really widows, let her assist them. Let the church not be burdened so that it can assist those who are real widows. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I wish there was a way to practice being annoyed or being angry. I know that when I go into a situation in which I might have to deal with a controversy discussion uh, that might go get kind of hot, I, I practice, I think through how I'll, th what I'll say ahead of time, because I, I, it, I it's important to be able to keep yourself together, right? But there's no way to really practice that actual visceral feeling of annoyance, frustration, and even anger. Paul writes to Timothy the first chunk of this 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 fifth chapter of First Timothy, uh, and he's writing to him, he's writing something he's probably said to Timothy many times before, like, as you're dealing with all of these things I've told you you're going to have to deal with, Tim, as you're dealing with leadership and controversy over what to teach, as you're dealing with factions in the church, Tim, you need to remember that if you win, but you've broken up the family, you didn't win. Right? So as you handle all this, you got to treat your older men like you treat your dad. Disagree with them, but disagree with them in the way you disagree with your dad. Treat your, your older women like mothers, treat younger men like brothers, and treat younger, younger women like, like you would your sister, right? with absolute purity, trusting in, in the purity of that person. Like if you think about what the, what's being asked here, I mean, we're, Paul is asking for... Timothy to have a pretty high level of sort of emotional stability, emotional intelligence, as it's sometimes called. And um, really just remember, as you deal with these conflicts in the church, remember that 
you're dealing with family. And he doesn't really harp on it at any great length, and so I'm not either, But because he, he then moves on to talk about one particular challenge of family. Paul starts talking to Tim about, how do you take care of grandma? How do you take care of grandma? You got grandma in the church, what, what's that, what's that going to look like? And, and the problem with grandma, to put it as blunt as possible, is a severe lack of grandpa. Right? Widows. That, that's the challenge here. Grandmas without grandpas, they, with, you don't have, they don't have the husband there to uh, do that, that half of the work, and someone to make the, the money or bring home the bread while the, the, the wife uh, keeps the house. Right? That, that's the, how, how it worked back then. And in first century Mediterranean society, there really wasn't any support for uh, widows. Once the husband died, there was no like social security. Uh, there isn't any like savings. It's, a, it's not a cash society, so there, you can't really save up stuff from year to year. You have uh, your, the, the farmland, but whoever is working at the farm. But um, there's no like designated way. This is how widows are going to be supported. They had no legal rights. Um, if you weren't Roman, you weren't a citizen. And so what the people in these churches, they're not Roman citizens. They're just, they're less, right? They're not considered uh, full people by Roman uh, law. And, and women were at the bottom of that, that barrel, especially old women, and have, don't have men to stand up for them. And, and yes, in Jewish culture, there was a, a strong tradition of taking care of uh, older women, but these churches are not full, especially at Ephesus and these new Greek uh, churches, they're not full of people who have studied the Greek, Jewish culture their whole life. They haven't grown up in Jew, as Jews. So um, there's not that strong commitment to taking care of widows. And so uh, Paul has to lay, out, lay it out for them. And he's rather blunt, right? Uh, and he, he tells them, right, if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn their religious duty and take care of their, their grandparents, right? For this is pleasing in God's sight. And whoever does not provide for relatives, and especially for family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Like, that's, that's amazingly blunt. But that, that's why Paul puts it to him. Like, if go to the family, right? If you, you have widows in the church, and, and if they're not getting taken care of, go to the family. Have them take care of, of grandma. Uh, and if you, they don't do it, it makes them worse than an unbeliever. They're not acting out their, their faith. So what about those who don't have... So that's those, those gram, grandmas who have family. What about the grandmas who don't have family? Well, honor widows who are really widows and put those widows on a list. That's what Paul directs Timothy. So that, there's this list, but it's not for everybody. It's for those who are really widows. And what does it mean to be really a widow? Like, we're not debating whether grandpa's dead or not. Like, we're not having a discussion about whether uh, the, the husband really has died. The question is, are these older women, like, they've been in the church for a while. The church has been established at Ephesus uh, for a long time, for decades now, at this point, when, when Paul writes this to Timothy. And so at this point, the widows or the real widows are the widows who have become part of the church family, really. And they have a lifetime of fruit to show for them. By, the, by, your, by their fruit you shall know them, Jesus says, right? Are they the, the widows? Are they the women who in their lives have taken care of the saints? Are they the people who have stepped up and kept the church family woven together? Have they committed themselves in prayer and worship and service to what the church does? So that's what Paul's getting at. He says that when they're a real widow, that's what he, he is getting at. And if that's the case, they can go on the list. And this is something that the church had been doing since the very beginning. If you go back to Acts 6, that's where the, the idea of this list first shows up. That What happened in Acts 6, the first church is back in Jerusalem, um, there was some content, contention about 
uh, who was being treated better, the list of widows the, the church was taking care of. And so the first deacons were selected to make sure that all the people on the list, the widows list, were taken care of uh, equally. All right, so that, that's, this is something the church had been doing for decades at this point. And, and so Paul had, had some rather practical hands-on wisdom. This is how you have to manage the list, right? Put on, who do you put on the list? You put on the real widows, the widows who have been deeply woven into the life of the church and have something to, to they've shown that they're, they're woven into what it means to be part of a community that follows Jesus. And so how did this work? Like, okay, your grandma gets on the list. There, she, grandma doesn't have a, a son or a grandson to care for her, and she's on the list. What, what actually happened right, at Ephesus or over in Acts where, where this was also happening? Well, what happened was people would get together to worship, and they would get together to worship before they went to work on Sunday because Sunday is Lord's Day, and they would worship on Sunday. But the weekend had not been invented yet, and so uh, Sunday was not a day off. So they would get together before their work day, an early service, you might say, and they would worship. And part of their worship, they would hear the word of God, and then they would respond. They would respond by offering. So they would pass plates, and plates are what you put food on. And that's what they would offer, because it was not a cash-driven society. It was not a coin-driven society for, for sort of common, everyday folk. And so it was more of a barter and trade. And so they would put their offering on, and what they offered was what they had to eat that week. Right? Their first fruits, the grain, the fruit. And so they would pass the plates, and then they would share the plates. They would have every time the early church gathered for worship was communion, and communion was a meal, eating the food off of the plates that they had passed to gather the offering, right? So the offering and the meal were the same thing. And then they would have leftovers, because every church meal always has leftovers, right? And so what do you do with the leftovers? The list. You took the leftovers, and the deacons would go and bring the leftovers to the widows on the list. And that's how they would get their food for the week. Right? And then anything leftover of the leftovers, after the, there was more than what the widows needed, that would then go to the general public, anyone who was in, outside of the church entirely, who needed food for, for that week. And, and so, uh, if you look at what this means, if you were on the list then, you were on the list until you died. Like to be a widow on the list. It's not like widows were going to start being able to care for themselves. To put someone on the list was a commitment. This church is going to make sure that this woman will eat for the rest of her life. Because we will gather weekly, we will offer, we'll have our meal, and then the leftovers will make sure that she has enough to eat for the week. It is fascinating to think about how that has changed today. Like I have been trained in a ministry-based setting on how to help people when bills and just things go sideways. I worked at the Greensboro Urban Ministry in Greensboro, North Carolina. This has been 20 years ago now, but back then, and they're still doing it, but back then I, knew the, I know the number. They were giving away $600,000 a year into the community uh, to help people in the community. And so they were interviewing people every day of the week, and I was part of the, the people who was interviewing. So I was trained, and I learned how to interview people and do it graciously, but make sure to really do it in a vigorous fashion and bring people in, and you'd sit down, and you would listen. And then you would get out a piece of paper, and you'd work up their budget, their incomes, their expenses, and then you'd validate those expenses. You'd get a copy of the bill. You'd make sure that the income that they told you actually was what was happening, because you want to make sure you make a decision based on a very clear understanding of the situation. And, and then at the end, once you've assessed it all, you would then uh, go make your recommendation to the director, who would then decide how much uh, money could be spent in this, this situation. And I have taken this approach with me, and I have used it for a decade and a half of service to the churches in Northeast Missouri. And this is the approach that uh, other the Minister Alliances I've worked with have used. This is a church I've found in other the approach I've found in other churches. And the assumption is 
Like just the basic assumption of how this tends to work is that the pastor has a line item. Like I have a certain amount of money I can spend per year and I'm going to use it and it's going to be almost, I, I can't think of a time it has been anyone but someone outside the church. It is to help people outside the church and it's always with a sense of, is this a crisis I can get you through? Or a situation. Because if it's a crisis I can get you through, if I can pay 200 bucks, 400 bucks, and get, get someone through little Timmy breaking his arm, and then you're back up and stable, great, right? But if, if, I have, but if, if you come to me with a bill, and, and it's like two or three months of electric bill that's behind, it's like 600 bucks, and if I pay this, there's no way you're going to be able to pay it the next month, I'm not going to do anything Oh, I'm not going to pay that bill. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you any food you want because I can always come up with food. And, and I'll offer, like, I will help you move in with your mom over in Marceline or I've offered to buy people sleeping bags because uh, I won't pay your electric bill, but I don't want you to be cold. So here, have a, I'll, I'll buy you a sleeping bag because I don't want you to be cold. Like, I will always be able to do something. But just like, that's how I've thought through and practiced helping people uh, over the years it is... How do I get someone outside the church through a crisis? And that's very different than this. That's completely different than this. Like, I look at what Paul is describing here, and, and like, yes, it, it's comparable in that, like, we, we don't, we pet what we put in a plate when we pass a plate is money. We don't put food, uh, it, money stores better, right? But, uh, like, we're still passing a plate, we're still gathering resources, but the way that we assist people has changed dramatically and it probably would be worth taking the time um, to try to understand why it happened the way why that changed but what I can tell you is it's changed we're not doing what the early church did we're doing something very very different um, because back then and like there's also some things have changed as well like back then the people who were most likely to be in bad shape were the widows and that's probably true today so it's not necessarily that we could only help widows in this, this, what we're reading in the letter of Paul, but just like the idea of helping people who, who aren't going to get to be in a better situation, right? Paul is helping the church think through, telling them, how do you help people who, who aren't going to get better, who things are not going to, to change? Like they, they came, the widows need food this Sunday, and they're going to need food next Sunday at the church in Ephesus. And what would that look like today? Like that's just the challenge that reading this scripture like, I read the scripture and I thought, well, this is interesting. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. And, and it took me a day or two to realize, wait a minute, this list, this is not crisis support. This is a long-term commitment to a set of individuals that we're not going to just get you some groceries and electric bill today. We're going to pay your bills until you die. Like, we're going to put you on a list and we're going to take care of you because your family, you're part of this church, and this is how... It's, it's going to work. And if we were going to think through, like, how, how do we even begin to, to do that today? I don't have a good answer. I don't have an option to present. Like, I know the budgets for both of the churches I serve. And uh, there really isn't room in either budget for uh, being able to take on a list of widows or, or, or people who, who are in such bad situation that they don't need this assistance today, but they need assistance until the end of their lives. And so, like, it makes me ponder, like, what, what would it, like, what that would start to look like is, like, if someone needed food to say to someone, like, you, when you do your monthly grocery run, charge it to the church. Wow. That, that's, that's crazy to think about a church doing. But that's, that's what was happening back then. So I don't know what it would look like to take this seriously and to do, like, how to apply this. It does raise a lot of questions, and maybe here is, is what, what we could at least try. A wise man I've heard said, uh, a sage of the church has said that... Um, Sometimes you need to figure out what the next faithful step is. Like you can't figure out the whole thing. Just what's the next faithful step? Okay. What might be the next faithful step for us? Here's an option. All of us are going to get old. It's going to happen. The finances of getting old are challenging. 
Maybe the next faithful step for us is to make sure that we talk to someone here in our church family about that. Tell them, you know, this is, I'm not sure this is going to work out. This is what I'm thinking. This is how I'm going. And I say that because like one of the great taboos of our culture is we don't talk about money. We don't talk about something that private. But my friends, if the church family is going to begin to think through how do we walk with people through the hard times, some of which are near the end of life, we got to start talking about some of that now. Right? So maybe that's what we leave with today, is first an amazing appreciation of how committed those early church people were, like that they were willing to take on that, that, that they were willing to have a list. It's just amazing. And maybe our response is to say, we're not ready to have a list. But maybe we as a church need to be a little bit more open with each other about what uh, our future holds for us. Maybe. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our days not just these days, but the days that will come. The days that will come when we won't be young anymore. Not only when we will not be young, but we, when we, like the widows of Ephesus, might be in hard situations. We ask that as a church we might lean on each other, take care of each other, love each other in ways that are practical and real. We pray for those who are loving and caring for our communities, health care, for the teachers, for all those uh, who are carrying such great burdens in these days. We pray for them, and uh, we pray for our ministry into the community, that they might see that what we are doing is, is a way that is only made possible, and that we follow you. Amen. Peace be with you. Go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.